The title of this video is Why Banco Filipino Failed. Its subtitle is Where Were the Regulators? This PowerPoint video presentation attempts to explain the following points. First, why Banco Filipino failed. Second, why it should have been closed much earlier. Third, why the regulators failed to act in a timely manner. Fourth, why the inaction of the regulators led to a costlier failure for all concerned, namely, depositors, investors, and taxpayers. Fifth, why this inaction leads to an erosion of trust and confidence in the Philippine banking system. And sixth, why it also fosters an environment wherein a bank owner can steal from his own bank and do so with impunity. On March 17, 2011, Banco Filipino was ordered closed by the Philippine Central Bank, or the BSP, and was placed under receivership. The closure was the bank's second closure in its 47-year history. The bank was clearly insolvent. Its ratio of non-performing loans stood at 91% of its total loan portfolio. Over 50% of its total loan portfolio was made to insiders in what they call DOSRI loans. DOSRI is short for directors, officers, stockholders, and related interests. The bank was clearly losing money on its loan portfolio. Its interest expense exceeded its interest income by 1 billion pesos a year. But the bank was already in this condition way back as early as 2002, up to 2004. On December 4, 2002, the bank received a 180-day special liquidity facility of 3.5 billion pesos from the BSP, of which it availed 1.34 billion as of December 2002. In March 2004, 86% of its total loan portfolio was already classified as non-performing. Dusri loans already made up 30 to 40% of its total loan portfolio. Moreover, according to the BSP, Banco Filipino lost over 2 billion pesos a year from 2007 to 2010. In other words, the loss has exceeded its last reported capital base of 1.6 billion pesos as of March 2004, every single year since 2007, possibly even earlier. In March 2009, Banco Filipino again needed BSP's help when it requested and received from the BSP a total of 4.1 billion pesos in overnight clearing lines from January 30 to March 26, 2009. Because its cumulative losses of 11.86 billion pesos from 2007 to 2010 essentially wiped out the bank's capital of 1.6 billion pesos as of March 2004, several times over, the bank was essentially run as a Ponzi scheme. New money replaced old money. Cash inflows essentially came from two sources, deposit growth of 8.5 billion pesos since March 2004, and 4.5 billion pesos in past due emergency loans from the BSP. This Ponzi scheme was run with the full knowledge and consent of the bank's regulators. BSP had a controller in place since 2002 as a condition of extending Banco Filipino some 1.34 billion pesos in emergency loans. It had to know what was going on. Otherwise, the BSP regulators can be accused of gross incompetence. Moreover, silence from BSP and the Philippine Deposit Insurance Corporation meant consent. Otherwise, why keep an obviously insolvent bank open? At any rate, this has proven to be very costly for everyone. Depositors, investors, and taxpayers. All lost, and lost heavily. Moreover, their losses were magnified by the failure of the regulators to act sooner. Had the bank been closed earlier, the losses would have been much smaller. For instance, Banco Filipino's deposit base was placed at 15 billion pesos as of September 2010, instead of its 6.5 billion peso deposit base in March 2004. The uninsured deposits alone, at the time of closure, was estimated at 5.6 billion pesos, almost equal in size to the total deposit base of 6.5 billion pesos in March 2004. The Philippine Deposit Insurance Corporation could have saved a substantial portion of the 9.4 billion pesos it has to pay out 
to depositors of Banco Filipino from its deposit insurance fund. The regulators refuse to move in on Banco Filipino, despite complaints from Banco Filipino's minority shareholders, who had a direct and indirect 10% stake in the bank. In 2003, the BSP was asked by minority shareholders to place the bank under investigation for fraudulent practices, claiming that bank management and its directors had put the bank and its depositors in jeopardy. Minority shareholders provided BSP and the Monetary Board with a report that documented around 2 billion pesos in fraudulent loans to six dummy corporations that were closely affiliated with Banco Filipino's controlling shareholder, Bobby Aguirre. Not only did the minority shareholders sue Banco Filipino, they also sued both the BSP and the Monetary Board to replace Banco Filipino's board and management and, if need be, place the bank under receivership. Despite this, nothing happened. The minority shareholders were shut off from the bank. Basic corporate governance practices that would have provided some protection to investors and depositors were routinely ignored. The bank did not have any audited financial statements since 2002. It held no formal board meetings since 2002. The minority shareholders, or any investor for that matter, had no access to information regarding the bank's financial condition. This happened despite Banco Filipinos being a bank in the highly regulated financial sector, being a publicly listed company, and having the presence of a BSP installed controller since 2002 as a condition of BSP's extension of emergency funds to the bank in 2002. Clearly, the regulators are at fault. The BSP has supervisory oversight over the banking sector. The Philippine Deposit Insurance Corporation monitors conditions of banks because it steps in when a bank is placed under receivership and it insures deposits when a bank fails. The Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, is supposed to promote investor protection. It also ensures and enforces adherence to internationally accepted corporate governance practices. The Philippine Stock Exchange is a self-regulatory organization. It disciplines listed companies that do not follow its rules, the most basic of which is to provide investors with information regarding a listed company's financial condition. The minority shareholders did not sit still all these years. Because the BSP and other regulators refused to move, the minority shareholders pushed their case all the way to the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court, on June 19, 2009, ruled that all bank fraud cases are the exclusive jurisdiction of the BSP. The minority shareholder had no recourse to the regional trial courts, even if the BSP did not act on their complaint. This ruling applies to all Philippine banks. Its consequences are severe, particularly for minority foreign investors in banks, who may not have the political connections of their local partners. Their investor rights will be greatly diminished. It may dissuade both foreign and local investors from further investment into the Philippine banking sector. Why are the regulators acting this way? Why were they reluctant to act at great cost to everyone else? One possible reason is that they can personally face years of punitive litigation. And Banco Filipino provides a decent precedent when its earlier closure in 1985 by the central bank, the predecessor of the BSP, was ruled by the Supreme Court in 1991 as arbitrary and with grave abuse of discretion. To this day, the central bank, the estate of the late central bank governor Jose Jobo Fernandez, and three other central bank officers, face an 18.8 billion peso damage suit, launched by Banco Filipino. Another reason is that, both the media and the regulators, tended to characterize the Banco Filipino case as a family squabble and inheritance dispute among members of the Aguirre clan, who have a controlling stake in the bank. But by doing this, by characterizing it as a family squabble, the regulators and the media both ignored the serious possibility of bank fraud. They also exacerbated the losses of depositors, investors, and taxpayers, and, by not acting in a timely manner, they contributed to the unnecessary depletion of the deposit insurance fund. This inaction clearly erodes confidence in the banking system. It fosters a control fraud environment wherein a bank owner 
uses the bank he controls as a weapon to commit fraud. In other words, a determined and criminally minded bank owner can steal from his own bank and get away with it, possibly for years on end. Regulators are either incompetent, powerless, or are too intimidated, or are too unwilling to stop the fraud. The fraud only stops when the bank runs out of money and collapses. Bank fraud cases are rarely prosecuted. If prosecution is allowed to proceed, it can be a very slow process. How many banks have failed in recent years due to possible fraud and DOSRI violations? Orient Bank, Capital Development Bank, Urban Bank, Homeowners Savings and Loan Association, All Asia Bank, and the Legacy Group are all relatively recent examples. Moreover, prosecution is a slow process, especially in the Philippines, where well-funded owners can put up all sorts of legal obstacles before justice is finally served. For instance, the prosecution of Jose Go, the owner of Orient Bank, which failed way back in 1998, was only allowed to proceed in November 2009. The case is still pending in court. The slow pace of justice certainly breeds a culture of impunity. As a consequence, the cycle of possible fraud continues. As recently as November 2010, the BSP announced that it was actively monitoring eight large commercial banks for possible DOSRI violations. In this environment where punishment is rare, how can the public continue to place their trust and confidence in the Philippine banking system? In this environment where regulation is poor and ineffective and fraudulent banking practices continue with impunity, the best way to rob a bank in the Philippines might be to own 